Amen, amen. Well, good evening, everyone. We'll get our service started this evening with hymn number 410. 410, Standing on the Promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. My Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I now can see, perfect cleansing in the blood for me, standing in the liberty where Christ makes free. Standing on the promises of God, I'm standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, mount to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God, I'm standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. I love singing Fanny Crosby songs. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. 489. <laughs> Pass me by. 
690 he leadeth me what a blessed thought amen 690 to see you here. I had gotten a phone call and a text from a couple of folks that uh, the traffic has been horrible up at 494 and 1485, but I'm glad some of you made it through that. Even some of you had to come around the back way to get here. Uh, been a bad storm here this afternoon, and uh, anyway, things have just kind of been a mess. And so I've talked to, to Tex Dot, and I've talked to them about putting a freeway through here to help maybe alleviate some of that traffic, and they said they'd get right on that, okay? So it's good to see you tonight, and those of you that are home watching, we appreciate you praying for us, and uh, 
and, and uh, I have a couple things to ask you to pray about, and I know that some of you have been praying for our sister Linda Elsey. Uh, she's been ill since Monday, and Brother Elsey called me uh, about an hour ago, and uh, like two hours ago, and said that they had just gotten home from the hospital, and that uh, they, had her, they treated her there today, and she's doing better, but still need your prayers. And so please pray for uh, Sister Linda Elsey tonight in your prayers, okay? And also, uh, Brother Ed and Sister Debbie have been downtown taking care of some, some medical checkups, and they have not made it back. And so he told me you probably wouldn't. And so I asked Brother Kenneth Elsey if he would preach for us tonight, so we're looking forward to hearing from him here in just a few minutes. What a blessing it is uh, for Brother Kenneth to still be with us, at least for us it is, but for him, probably a little bit frustrating. He's been trying to get back into Bolivia now for a while, and uh, you continue to pray for him about that. Remember to pray for Brother Griggers and Sister Linda and what's going on there in Europe and Blue Dens, and also for Brother John Yalls and what's going on in the prisons. All of that's still locked down. I know he would appreciate your prayers, he and Sister Virginia. Then Brother Kevin Byer and Shiloh, please remember to pray for them as well. Now also, each week I ask you to pray for President Trump uh, and uh, wisdom for him as he leads our country and all the things that go on there. Let's pray for our teens next door as they're having their class here in just a moment. All right, we're going to go Lord in prayer, and then we're going to turn the service over to uh, Brother uh, Kenneth Elsey, our missionary to Bolivia. We thank God for him, for his family. And so let's pray at this time, all right? Let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we come before your throne. What a privilege it is to do so. And Father, we pray tonight, uh, Lord, for your good hand to rest upon the service here to East River. And I pray, Lord, that you'd use your servant to speak to us through your precious word. Thank you for blessing Sister Linda today. And, and, uh, and Brother Garrick, we pray that you'd comfort them tonight, help them to rest well. Pray for Brother Ed and Sister Debbie. And God, that you'll bless them and their health. And Lord, we pray tonight for Brother Jim Griggers and Linda. We thank you for their faithful service in Austria. We pray for Brother John in Virginia and Brother Kevin and Shiloh Byer there in Australia. And we pray for our president tonight. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you might put a hedge about him, protect him, give him wisdom and good counselors around him, Lord. And uh, Father, just I pray you'll help him as he leads our nation. Pray for Brother Lewis now as he works with our youth, that you'll encourage him and bless him as he uh, tries to minister to them tonight. And now, Lord, I want to thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your kindness, and for your divine truth. And thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, most of all. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, Brother Kenneth, if you would, come on, brother, and preach to us tonight. Amen. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 66. Psalms chapter 66. <clears throat> I hope all of you got your email. Uh, I know Brother Ed has been preaching on the home and uh, sent out an email, actually to the men, to I wanted to preach on what you wanted me to address in your home this evening. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh but I didn't get anybody's, uh, anybody's uh, desires except for Brother Dwayne, so we'll just be addressing one household tonight. And uh, Amen. But that's plenty, plenty to preach on, so we should be good. Amen. They know I'm joking. I was just playing with them earlier tonight. Psalm 66. And uh, no, I normally like to preach on stories in the Bible. I like to take people in the Bible and preach kind of the story that's going on there tonight. That, that is not what my plan. And uh, I want to talk about three things that will stop God in our, in our lives. Three things that will stop God. I, I, I do believe that we know that God is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's... Uh, omnipresent, we know that he's all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present, and uh, you, so you could ask the question, well, how could you stop God? You know, he's, uh, he's all-powerful. There's no way to, to stop the Lord, and, and uh, we could, you know, I, I used to like to watch uh, uh, 
the strongman contest. These guys, these great big old guys picking up different things and, and uh, just proving that they're the, they're the strongest man in the world. And, you know, you could take a thousand of those and they wouldn't be anything compared to God. You know, a thousand of those men. Uh, for the young kids, in your mind, you could take all the superheroes and add them all together and, and they wouldn't be anything compared to God. As, uh, he's all powerful. But what could stop God in our life? And we're going to look at three things. There might be other things, but I just picked out three things tonight. And I hope that it'd be a blessing to you tonight to see these. Number one would be, uh, well, first of all, we'll read Psalm 66, 18. Psalm 66, verse 18. It says, If I regard iniquity in my, life, in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I believe that sin is something that will stop God in our life. I believe if, uh, you know, uh, it says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So that, that is kind of the way it's stated there is that you know that it's there. If there's sin in your life and you know that it's there and you're, and you're overlooking it, you're dismissing it, you're not dealing with it, you're, uh, you're, you're not uh, uh, addressing it in your life, I believe that can stop God from hearing your prayers. That would... Uh, you know, uh, have you ever been asked to pray for somebody? Like tonight, we've uh, pastor had mentioned several people that needed prayer, and and have you ever been asked to pray for somebody? Maybe in a, a time of urgency, and you feel like, man, I'm going to push through this, but I I need to get right before I pray for somebody else. You've ne maybe never been there, but I have been there before. I've been there where I, where I felt like I, uh, I needed to pray first and pray and get some things settled in my life before I begin to ask God for somebody else's life. Well, that's a, that's a bad place to be. We shouldn't be in that place, but I, I believe a lot of God's people find themselves in that place where their, their prayers are not getting answered, and you say, well, you know, I mean, God has been answering my prayers. A lot of times we're, we're praying the same thing that other people are praying. We're all, we're, a lot of us are praying the, the same prayers. You know, what Pastor mentioned tonight uh, a couple prayer requests, and we could maybe be praying for that and saying, well, you know, my prayers are getting answered. But, uh, but a lot of other people might be praying for that same thing. If, uh, I think sometimes we have things in our life that we just hadn't addressed, we hadn't looked at, we hadn't... Uh, uh, brought before the Lord, and it's things that we've just harbored in our life. Prayers that we've just, uh, I mean, sorry, sins that we've just harbored in our life. Uh, if pastor was going to go to your house this coming Sunday, you invited him to your house, I believe uh, you would probably clean the house pretty well, and especially if he hasn't been there often, he doesn't, you know, it's not a a common thing for him to come over to your house, and so it's a big deal, and he's coming over, him and his family, and, and they're, you know, on their way, and you're trying to clean up the house, and you get it all clean, and, and then when he gets there, you know, someone that is not familiar with the place that they're going to, they see things that you may not see. Uh, you're there, you're thinking, man, we, we threw everything in the closet. We've got, you know, everything is put away, everything looks good. But somebody that is maybe not uh, accustomed of seeing this place much, they, they may walk in and notice that there's, there's trim that needs to be finished out in the house, there's paint that's, uh, that's not painted, there's tiles that's missing on the floor, there's, you know, things that we just see all the time and we think is, is just normal. Uh, years ago, I went to a church, and outside next to the church, there was a big, just a big pile of junk next to the church, and, and uh, when I went in the church, the church was really nice looking. Everything looked like it was in order and everything, and I wonder why they didn't clean that up, and I thought, you know, they've, they've probably just been coming in and out, in and out, and they've become familiar with that pile of trash sitting out there. 
And that's how we are a lot of times in our life. We, we've allowed things to come in and we hadn't addressed it. We hadn't, allowed, we hadn't uh, uh, brought it before the Lord and, and asked for forgiveness for these things. And, and, um, and that, those things are now hindering our prayers. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 17, it says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good... And doeth it not, to him it is, to him it is sin. I, I like to use that verse to people that that uh, that believe they can lose their salvation. A lot of those people that think they can lose their salvation, they they really believe they're above sin. They 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 believe they're not, you know, uh, sinning in a way that would send them to hell. And and this this verse here. Man, it's therefore to him that knoweth to do good and do it not to him it is sin. That's, there's a lot of things that we know to do and we're not doing. There's a lot of areas in our life that, that I think that, you know, we just look at our life. The other day, Pastor and I, I think it was Pastor and I, were talking about how that people, people put things in their life and they think if they're doing these things, then they're spiritual. If they read their Bible so many, so many minutes a day, if they pray so many minutes a day, if they cut their hair a certain way, if they, if they dress a certain way, then they're spiritual. And they look at other people and they think, well, they don't do my laws, they don't do those things that I've, I've laid down, then, then they look at you as unspiritual. And, and a lot of times people... They, they think, well, you know, I don't drink, I don't cuss, I don't uh, do this and I don't do that and I don't do this and so I'm spiritual. But a lot of times, this, this right here, this verse, a lot of times there's so many things we don't do that we know to do and that thing has now become sin in our life. That, uh, you know, we know it's right to... Not forsake the assembling. I appreciate Pastor saying that this, this last Sunday. Assembling. I've never looked at it that way. But uh, Hebrews 10, 25 talks about that. How that we, that we need to assemble. Amen? We know that's correct. And I believe that if we don't watch it during this time of the coronavirus, we can, we can get to the point where, where we, we get comfortable not assembling anymore. But God says that we need to assemble. We need to assemble. I understand. I'm not, not trying to say that if you're, doing, if you're still uh, uh, being cautious and not coming, I, I'm not talking about that, but, but I think there's some people that just say, I, I'm, I'm just as good just sitting here at my home watching, watching it on TV. I get the same thing they get. No, God wants you to encourage somebody here. God wants, I mean, just your presence being here tonight. Is, is it a blessing to other people? So, uh, you know, we know it's right to forgive, but some of us are har uh, harboring unforgiveness in our heart. Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, Mark uh, eleven twenty five says, And when uh, you stand praying, forgive. If you have uh, aught against any that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. We have a responsibility to forgive. Now, if that person don't want to, uh, to do their part and, and, uh, and, and forgive, then that's not your problem. But our, we must forgive. God says that if we're forgiving, then He will forgive us. And why are you saying that? Why are you saying these things tonight about ways that we could stop God? I believe there's some people that are keeping God from doing great things in their life because they're harboring unforgiveness. They have an unforgiving spirit in their in their heart unwilling to forgive, but you don't know what they did to me. Can we just put ourselves in the place of the Lord Jesus tonight and think about what we do on a daily basis to Him? And He continues to forgive us, continues to be 
gracious to us when we deserve. We don't deserve His grace and mercy. The Bible talks about to love one another. John 15, 12 says, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. That's a commandment, that we love one another like God loves us. I think I could write in my Bible, I have never done that. You know, I love Kenneth Elsie more than I love anybody else. It's sad. But, uh, you know, I don't do without food. And uh, I don't do without my needs being met. If, somebody's not, if somebody else is not meeting them, I love myself enough that I'm going to meet my needs. You, you understand what I'm saying tonight? Is... is uh, Love one another like, like Christ loves us. Wow, what a job. How in the world can I have the love that Christ has? I, I believe we can love other people through Christ. Through Christ. Some people are unlovable. But through Christ we can love them. People are affected by our decisions and, and the things that we do and the, the actions that we, uh, or, or the, the decisions that we make through our life. I want to look at the story of uh, the rich man. You don't have to turn there tonight if you don't want to, but in Luke 16, verse 23, it says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, this is the rich man, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in, in water and cool my tongue, for I am in torment in this flame. I am, I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth that, thy good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. You know, this rich man had a mother and a dad that loved him, I believe, probably. And, uh, but, but put yourself in, in, in his place, or his parents' place, as, as you've got kids that you love and you want the best for. And I believe that was probably his parents' thoughts, you know, but they taught him to love money. They taught him to love success. They taught him to love things. And now he finds himself in a place that he can't get out of. The Bible says, son, remember. God is wanting him to remember back about some things. Remember whenever it was all about you. Remember when it was, it was uh, your life was all about what you wanted. God's reminding him of, of some things and money and success and things, all these things, they're not bad things to have, but, but whenever it takes the place of God, then it's, it's not a good thing. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm mentioning some of these things tonight because I, I believe that, that uh, we just don't realize how far off base we are sometimes. When we have sin in our heart, I, I remember years ago growing up in, a, in an independent Baptist church that preached against everything. I mean everything. And, uh, and, and I, just, I just remember the, the, uh, the people trying to do their best to, to live for the Lord. And, and now it's, it's scary to me to see how Christians are and how lax they are about their Christian walk, and how that the things at one time in our life we thought were sinful, and now we don't think are sinful, and we're living in, in the midst of those things and think that everything is okay. And we're begging God to do things in our families, in our homes, and in our lives, and we've just got all this junk there.
Sin will stop God from answering your prayers. He ought to be our focus. How can you stop God tonight? I believe it's by harboring sin in your life. And then also, I believe another thing would be our unbelief. The Bible says in Matthew 13, 57 and 58, it says, And they were, and they were uh, offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. This makes me think that he would have done some great things in that area if they would have just believed. What are the things that we're missing out on because of our unbelief? What are the things that God... I mean, he's, he's ready. I can imagine in that town, there was some needs in that town that only God could handle. But because of their unbelief, he passed them by. How often do we get passed by because of our unbelief? God, God wants to do something for us. God wants to to bless us in a way, but because of our unbelief, we never see the blessings of God in our life. What are you holding God back with? Or what what, what are you holding back? Holding God back from doing in your life? Some struggle with their finances. Just struggle and struggle with their finances. And, you know, I've been to a place where God has blessed me and I've had plenty. And I've been to the place where I had nothing. But over the years of just being faithful, giving and giving and giving and giving and giving, I've never been without. I may have, I may have lacked some of the things that I thought I I needed, but God knew I did not need. I may have lacked maybe some of my wants, but, but you know, there is not a thing that I need in this world. God has been so good to me. Being obedient. You know, I, I just, I look at verses like in Malachi 3.10 and, and just claim those things that, that it's true. It says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that they're, May, may be meet in my house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I just believe that as fact. You know, I, I, I enjoy doing uh, uh, thrill-seeking things. I've, uh, on the the death road there in, 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 uh, in Bolivia, they had a, a uh, what is it, a zip line across that canyon there. And I mean, doing anything like that in a third world country is very thrill-seeking because you don't know how it's set up and, and what, what's going to, you know, <laughs> what might take place. But, but uh, uh, me and Michael, we, we did that one time doing the zip line across the, the, the canyon there, over 1,400 feet down. And uh, Michael, he was heavier than me, and when he got to the other side, he ended up, they just had a mattress strapped to a tree for a break. He ends up hitting the, hitting the mattress. And, you know, I, I enjoy doing some of those crazy things. I remember as a teenager, I, I bungee jumped out of a crane in Dallas, Texas. Bungee jumped out of a crane, and, the, you know, it was just connected to my ankles there. And I remember uh, while on debutation, I was in Colorado and I jumped off the Royal Gorge, 1,400 feet down, I believe, and a little river down there, and jumped off that with, bungee, with a bungee cord. But I really am kind of scared of heights. You know, if, if, I get to, if I get to just walking up to a window, like in maybe one of the big buildings in Houston, walking up to a window, that, that is kind of scary to me. But as long as I know that, that something has been proven, 
I can I can be okay with it. If I know that if I've seen other people bungee chunk, I just have faith in that in that cord that it's gonna hold me because it's held a lot of other people. And and so uh, <clears throat> I'm able to to do some of those things just because I I have faith in in that that uh apparatus or the person or, or whatever, but moving in my life forward with God, whenever God just makes a statement like this in Malachi, it, it just it just it seems easy for me to say, I'll give it. If you want me to give, God, if you speak to my heart tonight, then and to give this or that, I, I'll give it. Because it's it's just it's just trusting in God. But I believe that many people are held back or hold God back because of their unbelief. Some are afraid to say, Lord, here am I. You know, where we come to church, we hear the preaching. We, we, uh, we do whatever's asked of us, but, but we're really afraid to just get to the point like Isaiah was. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, it says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who, who shall I send and who, uh, who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. You know, why couldn't we just say, God, if you need somebody, why can't it be me? Why can't I be the one that fills the gap? There's so many people that, that are uh, that, uh, in this world that you could use, but why couldn't you just use me? I believe people have fear of that tonight. Because God may say, I will use you. They're afraid. I remember after uh, surrendering her to go to Bolivia, I was pastor in Gospel Light Baptist Church, and and I uh, I resigned the church, and I told them I would stay until we got a new pastor. And uh, it didn't take long. We got a new pastor, and, and I moved on. I had a brand new truck at that time. And I, I, uh, the first thing that I did, I, I remember I said, we're going to up our missions. We're going to give more to missions. And I didn't have, you know, I was, all I had was the church that I had started there, and uh, that church supported me, and I think one other church, maybe my dad's church in, in Houston. And, and so I just had a couple hundred dollars coming in and that would not pay for my truck payment, that would not pay for the insurance and all that and I wanted to get rid of it but I had it and I thought you know the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to give in the area that, that I want to be blessed in and we upped our missions and, and in, a, in 14 months, a year and two months, we raised our support and went to Bolivia God was good to us. I believe some people maybe here tonight need to say, God, here am I. It may just be here in this church that he wants to use you. Sometimes we may never go to the mission field. We may never be called to preach, but God may just want to hear it from you. <laughs> Say, God, if you want me, I'll go. Just like Abraham. God didn't want Abraham to take his son's life, but he wanted to hear him say, if that's what you want, that's what I'll do. I think some of us are holding God back because of our unbelief. We don't believe that God would use us in that way. We don't believe that, that we have anything to give. 
when he's the one that does all the work. In Matthew 28, 18, 18 through 20, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy... I'm sorry, Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. God has commanded us to share the gospel, to carry the gospel. <clears throat> and why don't we tell people about him? I believe it's because of our unbelief. Our unbelief, our fear. Our fear that God would use us to, to, to be an instrument to reach somebody else for Christ. If your best friend was dying and, and you knew that tomorrow would be their last day here on this earth and God said, if you witness to them, I'll save them. You know, I don't, I don't believe there's anybody here that would, that would uh, not witness to them. I mean, if, we had that, if you had that guarantee that if I witness to this person, they will get saved. It's not that they will say, no, I don't want any of that. No, I've heard that before. Or slam the door in your face. Or, uh, you know, I, you know I, I don't want any of that religious stuff or anything like that. No, if there was a guarantee that if you spoke to this person that you loved them so much and they were dying that, that God would save them, I don't think there's anybody here that would pass that opportunity up. But a lot of times, because of our unbelief, we don't share the gospel. You know, we can't save anybody, but we can tell everybody. Psalms 126, verse 6 says, He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seeds, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, that's, a, that's, a, that's another promise of God. A lot of times, it's, it's not that first door that you knock. It's not that first person you talk to. It's not... I mean, even if God puts it in your heart, you're standing at the gas station, you're pumping gas, and God says, speak to this man or hand this man a track, that doesn't mean the guy's going to get saved right there. You know, and, and sometimes we, we are obedient, but we don't see the fruit of it, and we, and we, and we give up on it. And we believe that... I just don't know if that works. I think we hold God back when we convince ourselves that people don't want to hear or people, or, or we just don't have the ability to tell somebody. We don't, uh, you know, we, we, we talk ourselves out of telling others about Christ so much of the time. Would you stop somebody or would you run out in a, in a highway if a child was about to be run over? I don't even think you would think about that. You would, you would scream, you would, you would grab their attention, you would run across and, and grab a hold of them and pull them to safety. But there's people dying each and every day and we go day after day after day after day without telling anyone about Christ. Our unbelief. I believe that if we believe that it's the... It's the Word of God that changes the lives of others. Then we would be planting the Word of God all over. The apostles, the, the disciples, they did that. They saturated the city with the Word of God. Can you imagine Apostle Paul saying, I've ran my race, I'm ready to meet the Lord? I can honestly say that there's some things that I would like to do before the Lord came back. There's some things that I would like to do for Him before He came back, comes back. 
oh, I'd love for him to come back tonight, but, but uh, I think sometimes if we think about that, seriously think about that, is our house clean? Is our temple clean? Is our, is our life ready? Can we honestly say, I'm ready, Lord? I've witnessed to the ones you want me to witness to. I've done all that you've asked me to do here on this earth. I'm ready to see your face. In reality, there's some things that I need to, that I need to do. Then lastly, tonight... Another thing that I believe that will stop God, sin, unbelief, and love. Many times in my life, I've done things to hurt God. I believe Satan has went to the Lord and said, look what he's doing. Look where he's went. Look what he's looking at. And Jesus said, I paid for it. God, he's one of yours. God, I gave my life for him. And what God sees when he looks at me is the blood of Christ. My grandmother... My mother's mother, t- today is the fourth, an- uh, fourth year anniversary of my mother's passing on. But my grandmother, her mother, I remember she was always trying to take up for us. <laughs> At her house, we could stand on the coffee table and there was no consequences if she was the only one there. <laughs> If my parents were there, they were wanting to get us off or, you know, always uh, correcting us. And that's the job of a parent. But I remember my grandmother, she was always wanting my parents to give mercy to me. And that's the way the Lord is. That's the way Jesus is whenever, whenever the devil begins to accuse us of things and... and Jesus goes to the Lord and says, you know, I paid for that. I went to the cross for that. 2,000 years ago, I was thinking about Kenneth Elsey. When I walked up that hill and gave my life, the love of God has stopped him from giving me what I deserve. Matthew 26, 53 says, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my, to my Father and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? This was when he was going to the cross. Can you imagine all those angels looking down and saying, Lord, just let us go. God, would you just let us go? They're going to take his life. They're going to they're uh, beat him and they're going to they're gonna, uh, uh, nail him to a cross. Just let us go. And God's saying, no, because I love them. I'm going to let my son take their place. Because I love them, I'm going to let him pay for what they've done. Love will stop God. How are you stopping God tonight? Is there sin in your life? Is there unbelief? 
I thank God for His love and Him giving me something that I don't deserve, and that's His Son, Jesus Christ. Don't hold Him back in your family. You know, I talked about the rich man just for a minute, and the decisions his parents made affect, affected that boy. I think of Hitler. You know, Hitler had a mom and dad. Hitler was a baby at one time, precious baby at one time. But because bad decisions, he became something that that we don't even like to think about. Are you holding God back tonight? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you again for being good to us. God, just loving on us, giving us opportunity to serve you just like you did Jonah. God, you've, uh, you've been patient. God, I pray that tonight, if there be one here tonight that struggling with some things. Maybe they just need to let go and say, God, here I am. Here's my life. Take my life. God, I pray that you would allow this message to go home with us and allow it to maybe change our life from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.